Hi, everybody. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback, and we're being joined by Jeff Snyder, head of global research at El Ambra Investments. He's not an economist, which is probably why he's been able to develop a working model of the global monetary system. His research is unique and informative in ways an economist would never consider. He's going to join us to discuss his thoughts on inflation, deflation, and our current economic state. So ping in your friends, uh, everyone you know. A lot of people are excited to be talking to you. Uh, make sure you have the utmost decorum because we are live on one of the biggest stations in the country, WOR, 7, 10 a.m. Uh, this Saturday at 9. So if you miss it, we'll be on iHeartRadio podcast. Just search for the financial quarterback. So without further ado, for those of you who don't know Jeff, Jeff, give a quick 60-second uh, bio of yourself. Well, Josh, I think you did a pretty good job uh, introducing me to begin with. But, uh, yes, I'm, I work for a registered investment advisor here in Florida. We do basic portfolio management. And my financial role is essentially to describe what I think is reality, which is basically – taking a look at what the monetary system's like and how that affects not just markets, but the macroeconomic Josh, picture, and understanding all the various pieces that go oh, together. Oh, sorry, go it. ahead. I apparently muted myself, so I muted you, Jeff. But go ahead, give your 30-second intro again. Sure, okay, Scott. What I said was basically you could just repeat everything that you had just said at the, in your introduction, which is essentially that uh, my role at Alhambra Investments, which is a registered investment advisor, is simply to do research and to try to describe reality and put together uh, a lot of the macro state of the, the really the global economy and how it impacts markets around the world based on a religious obsessive focus with the monetary system, understanding that it's been the monetary system and the, break, and the breakdown in it that has led to and caused a lot of the things that we are now struggling to deal with in, uh, even in 2021. So I'll begin with this. What does your research point to regarding economic growth for 2022? For 2022 specifically, and more of the, the, uh, the overall broader general longer run context, it's really not anything good. If we look at specifically, you know, something like the uh, yield curve in the United States or global bond curves around the world, and that includes several money curves that are, that are uh, consistent with them, the 2020s in general don't look particularly good, and 2022 specifically looks a little bit worse perhaps than even 2021 was, realizing that 2021 was not necessarily all that great of a year around the world either. So we kind of went into the 2020 recession, COVID, shutdowns, lockdowns, all that stuff, and then when we came out of it, we didn't come out of it as strongly as maybe a lot of people have been led to believe. That has led to this idea that maybe the economy in, in, uh, for 2022 is closer to overheating, when in reality it's, it's maybe uh, much closer to cooling off uh, substantially. So I'm going to open up to questions. I know Joe has a ton of questions, so we're being joined now by Joe Carlosari, who uh, will we'll open it up with his first question. Go ahead, Joe. Okay, thank you. I hope you can hear me, Josh, and – uh, Jeff, um, the first question I had, and, and uh, I haven't heard you comment on this, Jeff, and I'm eager to hear it, is can you explain what effect, if any, the transition away from LIBOR is going to have on the euro dollar system? Well, there really shouldn't be any effect because, I mean, LIBOR contracts going back to September 11th, actually, have uh, written into the language of the contract um, the contingencies. So it's really just a matter of over the next 18 months as uh, LIBOR prices are going to continue to be fixed uh, over the next 18 months until the middle of 2023, coming up with what contingent rates, uh, what contingent benchmark rates the market's going to use in, uh, when LIBOR, if it does end up getting uh, shut down. So really, there shouldn't be too much of a disruption, more of a, more of a question marks about what, what the new rates are going to be. Now, the government's uh, regulators, especially in the U.S., have been pushing software, which is the standard ordinary financing rate, which is a conglomeration of rates, which makes it a – it raises a lot of thorny issues that maybe we don't want to get into here because it's not specifically a rate that tells us a lot about credit and liquidity risk because there's a lot of repo stuff, a lot of repo transactions embedded in it. So the, really the question is which rate is going to replace LIBOR eventually down the road? And by the way, 
um, a lot of the banks have been using, have been turning to, and over the last couple of weeks of this year, have been turning to something called Bisbee, which is produced by Bloomberg. So there's already sort of a transition away from LIBOR in that respect. The question is really about how useful any new, uh, any new uh, benchmark rates are going to be because the, the, the overriding desire here is to capture information from these market rates that can then be used to then price all sorts of things down the road. So, I mean, in one sense, it's not necessarily a big deal, but in another, there's a lot of question marks we don't really know about. There's a lot of, you know, is the new benchmark rate, whatever it is, and there might be more than one, are they going to really capture and contain all the information that market participants not just want, but they actually need to price, uh, you know, basically everything in, in global finance? Okay. So the next question, again, and again, we really appreciate you doing this, Jeff, because we have eagerly followed a lot of your podcast appearances. Uh, we, we, we have Bitcoin Clubhouse where we talk about these issues on a macro scale. And one of the things we try to do often is push back or discuss this narrative of central bank policies and its effect on asset markets. Uh, Bitcoin Tina is on the stage and he frequently talks about asset price inflation and the effect that central bank policy has on the asset market. So. I'd like to get just your view in general, to what extent you think central bank policy, uh, low interest rate policy, QE, et cetera, affects asset prices in general. How, how would you characterize the effect or, uh, or not effect of central bank policy on asset markets? Depending, depending on which market you're talking about specifically, I think the Federal Reserve and just central banks in general, the, the European Central Bank or even the Bank of Japan, they can have a profound and significant impact on asset market but I don't believe it's in the way that most people think. Most people think the Fed, QE, prints money, that money finds its way into the stock market, for example, or in real estate. And then the Fed is therefore blowing a bubble by printing money and, keep, and holding rates low. When the Fed doesn't do either of those things, the Fed doesn't print money, nor does it control interest rates, at least not the interest rates that matter, the longer term yields in the bond market, which are set by the bond market. So the Fed and central banks, they do have an effect, but it's more of a psychological effect. And I can tell you, from working in the financial services industry, that's the audience for the QE narrative, the idea that the Fed is printing money. And if you actually got Jay Powell in a room and held a gun to his head and said, does the Fed print money? How does it work in the stock market? He would tell you, we don't print money, and the stock market is our target audience. What we're trying to do, what the Fed is trying to do with QE, is to get people to believe that Federal Reserve policy is inflationary, and therefore act as if it's inflationary, whether it is or not. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, that doesn't work so well in the real economy, which is why the real economy has continuously lagged, and that's why bond market yields have been so low. But it works really well in the stock market because the stock market is not really anchored in any way to the fund, not, not anchored any, in any fundamental capacity to the real economy. So, you know, that kind of a fairy tale goes really well in, in those kinds of financial assets that aren't grounded in the real economy. So the Fed does have a profound impact on certain asset prices, but it's mostly a psychological impact where if you believe in the fairy tale that is QE, then you'll buy stocks, you'll buy real estate, you might even buy cryptocurrencies because you think the Fed is printing money and devaluing the currency when none of those things are happening. So, so just to follow up real quickly on that, and I, I agree with that, I'm probably in the minority in some of this group, it's mostly a psychological effect and I think your research and arguments are compelling in that regard. But can you say mostly, is there any effect uh, direct action of the Fed, for example, in the equity market, in your view? Is there a direct effect? No. I mean, there's no way to get from the Federal Reserve's bank reserves to, through the bank banking system on their balance sheets to the equity market. So I think in terms of stocks, it's almost purely psychological. Now, there might be some, you know, risk-taking effect from, you know, banks extending margin loans and margin credit, for example, uh, for example. But that's, that's really, I think, small, the, the smallest piece of it. And overall, it's really just this idea, this self-fulfilling prophecy where if you believe Jay Powell is supporting the junk bond market, for example, then you're going to buy junk bonds. You're going to call your clients and say, it's okay to buy risky assets because Jay Powell's got my back. Now, when history has shown time and again, the Fed really doesn't. It, it's really psychological. But it's a very powerful psychological tool. But again, I think if Jay Powell was here today and you made him answer honestly, he said, yes. It is psychology, and not only that, we are intending to manipulate stock prices because we believe there's a wealth effect. We believe that stock prices go up based on our psychological manipulation is good for the economy when there's really no evidence for that. Okay, that sounds, I'm going to hand – Real quick. I'm going to yeah. hand 
hand over the mic, but but that sounds very, for, for those who've not heard of your work, maybe give a little synopsis before we go to our next question of your theory, thesis, uh, so people who've never heard of, of you can kind of kind of encapsulate what you believe. Yeah, sort of the background here is that there's something called a euro dollar, and it's not just a euro dollar. Euro dollar is a specific term that means U.S. dollars that were on deposit outside the United States. And what happened many, many years ago, many decades ago, was that we had a monetary system, exogenous monetary system, developed sort of ad hoc and organically outside the U.S. to solve several problems, including Triffin's paradox. But essentially what happened was the banking system and the monetary system evolved such that by the 1960s and 1970s, central bankers had a really hard time defining, let alone measuring or controlling the monetary system. And what actually happened, what most people aren't aware of, is they just kind of threw up their hands and said, we can't do money anymore. We don't know how. The banking system has evolved in so, in so fast, so far, that we really can't keep track, especially since so much of this, this, this monetary system is outside the United States. Even though it's nominally denominated in U.S. dollars, it is still an exogenous offshore monetary system. So that left central banks with a, a very stark choice. I'm talking about the 1970s and into the 1980s, they could either double their efforts to try to understand what's going on in the monetary system, or they could just do something else. And what central banks around the world chose was to do something else, because the monetary keeping account, that, that was really difficult and probably beyond their capabilities anyway. And this other thing they chose to do was essentially say, we're going to manipulate uh, economic and uh, fin uh, financial market behavior by signaling, by doing, you know, raising and lowering the federal funds rate and later doing QE and things like that, because we can't control the monetary system. We can't even define the monetary system. So if we try to get people to believe in us and our ability to manipulate emotions and psychology, then that will be a good enough workaround, especially if we can manipulate bank behavior. So essentially the Fed has said, We'll try to control and, and send signals through the banking system and let the banking system work out the money behind it. Now, the problem with that is, of course, if you have a monetary breakdown in that exogenous banking system, what is the central bank going to do? Because it's no longer really a central bank. And that's really what describes what happened in 2007 and 2008 was a breakdown in the monetary system when there was no central bank left in the monetary operating in the monetary system because it had evolved and broken, it had broken free many decades beforehand. So when we talk about the euro dollar, what I'm really saying is that this, it's this outside monetary system that broke down in 2007 and 2008, and it has never healed itself. It's never been fixed because there's really kind of no way to do so. And so that's the central banks have been continuously spinning their wheels trying to do these QEs along the way because they have no real way to get into that monetary system and fix it. Oh, thanks for that synopsis. So next we're going to go to Ben, who has a question. For Jeffrey Snyder, if you're just joining us, Al of Alhambra Investments. Hey, thank you so much again for doing this, Jeff. Like I said, like Joe said, we've been following you for quite some time, and we are very familiar with your work. I'm wondering, because you know, I'm familiar with a lot of the stuff that you're talking about here. What would you, big, you know, red buttons? How how would you recommend that the the Fed or or how could we possibly fix this system that you keep saying is fundamentally broken? Um, what what could we do differently as a society? Yeah, that's that's the real multi-trillion dollar question, isn't it? It's how, what do we do now? It, it, it's been long enough. I mean, we're talking about 14 and a half years since the system broke down in August of 2007. So what do we do about it? The answer is obviously not QE. The answer is obviously not something the Federal Reserve or any mainstream ec economist can uh, give you an answer for. So it really means you know, is there any way to go back to the way things were? Do we even want to go back to the way things were? And I don't think we do because, you know, the late euro dollar period in the middle 2000s wasn't exactly an ideal system anyway. I mean, it was inherently unstable from the very beginning. So I'm not sure we even want to go back and rebuild the system as it was. And so what we're really describing is, hey, we're going to have to start again. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to rebuild this thing kind of from the ground up, or not, hopefully not from the top down, but from the bottom up where we can have sort of an organic ad hoc monetary uh, market-based solutions rather than trying to have some patchwork of official central bank, political, you know, nexus, trying to impose, you know, their own priorities on a monetary system that probably isn't going to be designed or it isn't going to be ready for those, those kinds of things to be imposed on it. 
So the, ideally, I think the answer is to get everybody number one. Step number one is to realize that we have a problem. We have a monetary problem. Step number two is to get people in the United States to understand that, you know, if we're talking about what we're really talking about is the, re the global reserve currency system and that the U.S. is not given any sort of exorbitant privilege by having the U.S. dollar denomination be that reserve currency system. And that is beneficial to everybody, including those in the United States, to do something about it, even if that means no longer using the U.S. dollar denomination. And then step three is to figure out what that is. And I think what, what that is is a rule, rules-based paradigm which um, kind of mixes uh, – is, is a mix or a blend of priorities which include – not just national political priorities, but more more purely economic and financial priorities, including limiting risk taking and making money more of a, a more sound money like than it has been at, at basically any time since the 30s. It sounds like Bitcoin a little bit, Jeff. <laughs> it starts to, doesn't it? And I wouldn't say, you know, I that's why I, you know, I'm pretty excited about digital currencies in general. I'm not. I have to say, I'm not excited about how they're priced currently. But in general, the technology kind of does open the door to a solution. It does. You know, what we're talking about right now, it, Bitcoin does sound a lot like that, like it could be something like that. I don't think it is. I think Bitcoin might have more of a role as a, you know, a monetary role of a store of value than as, as a useful and flexible medium of exchange. But it, maybe not Bitcoin, maybe some of the other, maybe it's more than one. Maybe we have several competing currencies that fill multiple roles at, at different times. And maybe that, you know, it, it may sound scary to most people, but I think that would be an elegant solution to what is a pretty intractable problem. Thank you. Next, we're going to go to HODL, American HODL. Go ahead. Hey, Jeff. Uh, my name is American HODL. A lot of us in the Bitcoin cryptocurrency community have uh, pseudonyms, and this is mine. <laughs> You know, I think it's interesting when you talk about, you say, a rules-based system. One of the things that we talk about in Bitcoin a lot is having a programmatic uh, monetary policy. Like, for instance, because Bitcoin is a decentralized code base, you know, that we all run and we all verify uh, on our own. Everybody who's an independent node operator in the system, um, you know, things things go off as scheduled without a hitch. And there's not a lot of human manipulation uh, in the system. And so I, I think that a lot of us see Bitcoin... As I agree with you that it might end up being ghettoized as a sort of store of value, but it won't be because uh, of a lack of its own intrinsic properties. It'll be because the people with uh, all the guns who write all the laws say it can't be so. <laughs> Is that how you sort of see things? I'm not so, no, I, I agree with much, most of what you're saying because it, I, I, I use the term digital currency more broadly than just Bitcoin for obvious reasons. But yeah, that's that's the that's the key there. I think that's the ideal situation where whether it's Bitcoin or something else, the rules-based paradigm that does best to both of, first of all protect the monetary system from manipulation and you know you know p political interference, but at the same time it needs to be dynamic. It can't be too rigid, and so there has to be a way to design the system so that it, it efficiently matches the demand for money with the supply of money, and that's a dynamic situation. It's a dynamic formula. It's a dynamic equation, but I think it can be done, and I think a digital currency medium is probably the best, most elegant way to do it. Whether that means Bitcoin or not, I think that's, uh, that's, that's a question that we probably won't find out for many years down the road, but I think in general, digital currencies have that kind of potential that if left to their own devices, and that's, that's kind of the point that you're raising, if left to their own devices, I think they will find the most uh, efficient solution down the road at some point. Yeah, it was interesting. I had Larry Kotlikoff on my show a while ago, professor at Boston University. He said, I don't know if you have any uh, comment on this. He said that he was talking to people at the Swiss uh, Central Bank, and they were having a, you know, all these high-end academics were talking. They're looking at creating a digital currency so that they can basically not have the U.S. involved. Um, I don't know if you've done any research on that, but basically they're looking at if the Swiss wants to do business with the Canadians, that they're they're really just done with the U.S. I don't know if you've done any research on that. Well, what you're basically describing is the euro dollar system. <laughs> I know it's, it's denominated in U.S. dollars, but you remember it's an offshore system that's operated by banks in that system. So by definition, it has bypassed the U.S. government to begin with. There's nothing. There's no role for the Treasury. There's no role for the Federal Reserve in it whatsoever. So I think what the Swiss are doing, especially with central bank digital currencies, 
is really more about being able to surveil and monitor the private commerce. And that's certainly what the Chinese have done pioneering their yuan digital currencies is they're basically testing surveillance powers rather than doing anything to, about what they don't realize is an elasticity problem in the global monetary reserve currency system. So when, when you hear central bankers talk about digital currencies, I think they're not even talk, they're not even the same planet that is, uh, is, as the uh, digital currency space is currently. They're way behind, and I don't think they have any idea they need to catch up. They're really just about throwing a, you know, throwing a coat of paint on a digital currency and hoping nobody notices it's not, a, it's not really a native solution. Oh, fantastic. What about, um, we're going to go to Zach, then Bitcoin, Tina, but first, what about people who say, you know, your system, I've never heard of, of your theories before I've heard of you, to be honest, and they say, well, this, you're a brilliant guy, but it's, it sounds like it makes sense, but it sounds a little bit like of a forced narrative where, where everything kind of fits into this worldview, and you're such a cogent articulator of it that you're very believable, but like... Give some proof on why it's not just not just your theory. You don't have to take my word for it. You can take their word for it. Um, all you got to do is a couple minutes of digging. For example, I can give you any number of quotes from central bankers around the world throughout history that have basically said we don't do money anymore. Most famous of which is Alan Greenspan in June of 2000 when he said – when they were debating the Humphrey Hawkins requirements, which – if you know anything about the Humphrey Hawkins requirements that going back to the great inflation in the 1970s, it required central bankers to produce money targets because back then even Congress realized that money is inflation. So they imposed upon the Federal Reserve these monetary targets that they were supposed to prepare and forward to Congress annually, but the provisions in that law sunset in June of 2000. The central bank got together and basically said, we don't do money because we can't. And the famous quote of, from Alan Greenspan was essentially that the proliferation of financial products is so extraordinary that the ability for us to base any policy on monetary conditions, whatever reality, is dubious. And that's just, that's just one instance where, you know, you go back to Alan Greenspan's 1996 irrational exuberance speech. Everybody thought that was about the stock market and the stock bubble. That's not what he said. What Alan Greenspan in 1996 said was that money supply trends had veered off past several years ago, and they're no longer useful for us to set any kind of economic agenda. And what he was really saying is what I was saying, that the monetary system evolved in such a way that central bankers could no longer keep up with it. Now, I realize that, you know, it does. It sounds like a conspiracy theory, but only because we've been taught and told, and the message gets reinforced every day, that yeah, the, the Federal Fed Reserve put. is in charge. Yeah, the Fed I'm put. Sorry? Yeah, the Fed put. Yeah, and, it's that, and realize what happens here. The Federal Reserve is doing this, this expectations-based policy, which absolutely requires everybody to buy into it. And you cannot buy into it if you have any doubts about what the Federal Reserve actually is. And so it has to reinforce the message that it is this all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful entity. Otherwise, the expectations thing just breaks down, which is why it has broken down. But I understand, look, it sounds like a conspiracy theory because for most people, this is the first time in their life they've ever heard of it. But as the first questioner today already said, we're talking about LIBOR. LIBOR, was, LIBOR is the euro dollar rate. It's the offshore U.S. dollar rate that's been around since 19, the late 1960s. So it's not like I've made up the term euro dollar out of the thin air. The euro dollar system has been around for all of this time. And I tell you, you don't have to take my word for it. You can do any number, all, all sorts of research on your own. Where in the early 1970s, these internal FOMC discussions, they kept saying M1 is obsolete, M2 is likely obsolete. Again, 50 years ago. And the reason was because they didn't know how to incorporate the euro dollar growth and expansion into the domestic money supply, even though they realized that it was having a profound impact on the domestic monetary and economic system. They just didn't know what to do about it. So my answer to that is don't take my word for it. Do your own research. And what you'll find if you actually look at uh, scholarship and evidence that produced by central bankers and economists, especially during the 70s and 1980s, that you'll see that the euro dollar system is there, and they even talked about it. It was only during this period, and especially the late 80s forward, that it kind of disappeared as this expectations management policy sort of coalesced. Yeah, people believe in Paul Volcker, you know, that, that Volcker yeah. was some type of mythological figure. Talk about that. Why isn't Volcker – 
this hero that people make him out to be? Because they believe that he's the one who defeated the great inflation. And that's where this expectation Fed put stuff all came from, the myth of Alan Greenspan, the maestro, was the idea that, Fed, that the Federal Reserve operating a determined monetary policy, so much that it will provoke not one but two recessions in the early 80s, oh, you better not fight the Fed because if, if we get into an inflationary situation again, any kind of, uh, any kind of central banker following Volcker's example, they'll put the economy in recession to stamp out inflation. So don't even bother fighting the Fed. And that's really where the myth came from. But if you spend even a minor amount of time going through the deliberations and discussions of the early 1980s and late 1970s during the, the early Volcker era, they were just winging it. And it was only afterward that they attributed the end of the great inflation to Volcker's policy when, at the time, Volcker was just as confused about the monetary system as Arthur Burns had been throughout the 1970s. And it was sort of like, you know, as the kids say today, it was gaslighting. It was going backwards and saying, we need this expectation-based policy to take over because we don't do money anymore. And the only way the expectations policy is going to work is we get everybody to believe the Fed is so powerful, you never challenge it. And so the Volcker myth kind of solved that, that difference in, in, the, uh, in the various ways of, of conducting monetary policy, which is really not monetary policy. So the Volcker idea, the Volcker mystique, is absolutely central to this conversion of the modern central bank from a monetary agency to this psychological manipulator. If you're just joining us, I'm Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback, and we're being joined by Jeff Snyder. If you miss an episode, you can catch us on the iHeartRadio app. Uh, this weekend, I think we'll launch it either Sunday or Monday. We'll be live on New York's WOR, 710 a.m. Also, uh, taking your questions right now on the Clubhouse app, and you can follow me and the other uh, people in this room on the stage. Next, we're going to go to Zach and then Bitcoin Tina. Go ahead, Zach. Thanks so much, and, and thank you, Jeff. This has been really fascinating and, and love to hear the, the nuance. Uh, I'm an attorney that practices in the digital asset space and with many of the folks on stage here, a, a real believer in Bitcoin as a solution to many of the monetary problems we're facing. Um, my question actually, though, is about nuance in the argument. I, I think, unfortunately, sometimes it's all too clear that we live in an age of sound bites and memes and, you know, beyond the you know idea of money printer go burr. Uh, how would you explain this to someone who doesn't have the time to really invest and, and dig in? To give them a sense of what the problem is and how we should address it. You're talking about the specifically monetary policy at the Fed? Yeah, yeah. Well, essentially, it's what do you do if you're the Federal Reserve? And the Federal Reserve, its only monetary tool outside of is, is open market operations. And so, essentially, all they have is bank reserves. And people never really stop and think and consider what are bank reserves? What is this, this accounting fiction that the Fed creates at the end of the QE rainbow? So essentially QE is nothing more than the central bank purchasing some kind of asset, some kind of financial asset from the banking system. And at the end of that, it's essentially a swap. I, I take a bond from the bank and I give the bond this, this account that already – the bank that already has uh, there, that already has an account at the Federal Reserve. I credit that, that bank with – Bank reserves. Now, bank reserves sound like it should be money. They sound like it should be base money. In fact, uh, you'll hear that term used a lot. Milton Friedman called them high-powered money even. So it sounds like the Fed is printing money because you actually see when they do quantitative easing or any large-scale asset purchase, the level of bank reserves will go up. And that's where the mean comes from, the money printer go burr, because the level of, bank, level of systemic bank reserves rises often precipitously into the trillions, as it is in the United States or Europe. But nobody actually stops and thinks, what are, what, are these bank, what are these bank reserves? What are they actually used for? And the answer is they're not used for anything in the real economy. I can't get my hands on bank reserves. You, nobody, nobody that's listening to us right now can get their hands on bank reserves. They're essentially an accounting creation, an interbank accounting creation that's, that's left over from this, monetary tra or this, from this financial transaction we call quantitative easing. And so just you know, not to go too much further into the weeds here, if the banks don't do anything in response to this asset swap where they're left with bank reserves, then there's no money creation. There's nothing. And in fact, what we often see is that um, whenever there's this, this rise in bank reserves, it's because of monetary destruction in the shadow euro dollar exogenous offshore system I'm talking about that we don't ever see. So even though you think, even if you think bank reserves are money when they're not, the fact that they go up doesn't really tell you all that much about the overall monetary picture. 
And then when you understand that bank reserves don't really have a real economic use, then you can start to really understand that the Federal Reserve, all they're really doing is raising the level of bank reserves to get people to think they're printing money, therefore being inflationary, and then we get back into our expectations policy regime. So it's really about, at its most basic level, it's the Federal Reserve creating bank reserves, not to print money or to create liquidity, but to get to, get to, to signal to the world that they're doing something. And if you believe in the Fed, you believe in the Volcker myth, and you don't think too much about what QE or bank, reser bank reserves are, then the Fed has done its psychological manipulation. The, you see the level of bank reserves go up. You think that's inflationary. That's really all monetary policy is supposed to do. But you take just a couple of seconds to start to think about what are bank reserves and what they really are, what they're really supposed to accomplish. Then you start to – that's when all the questions really start to come in because you realize this isn't really money. It's an accounting fiction that, goes, that, that comes at the end as a byproduct of this asset swap. So where does the money like go? Where, where, where do the reserves go? It's just a pure Nowhere. accounting fiction? There, the level of the reserves is, de is entirely dependent upon the Federal Reserve. Banks don't create them. Only the Fed does. Now, all banks can do is use them to settle you know, intrabank uh, uh, negative balances and overdrafts, like for, from the Fedwire system or SWIFT, or, uh, actually CHIPS uh, or uh, some of the other interbank uh, market systems. But again, they don't go anywhere. That's the point. It's not like it's physical currency that's being traded. It's not like the Fed is creating a, or the uh, the uh, banks that are that have credits at the Fed in terms of in, in the in the form of bank reserves are creating loans based off them. They're not using reserves for anything. The reserves just kind of sit there, and the Fed pays a little bit of an interest on those reserves, which is one reason why it's sort of an asset swap because you're swapping a bond for another asset that's highly liquid that pays you a, a small amount of return. But that doesn't tell us anything about the monetary system or the real economy and the amount of credit flowing through it because everything is determined by the banking system, especially those banks that are operating offshore in the euro dollar system. So bank reserves are simply an interesting sort of footnote to reality. What about the Fed? We hear, you know, they're buying bonds from the U.S. government. What about that? In monetizing the debt, yeah, yeah, that's 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 one of the primary uh, you know criticisms of quantitative easing is that the Federal Reserve is monetizing debt. They don't do it directly because they can't. So essentially, they entice the bond the the banks that are operating in the in the primary bond market to buy bonds at auction from the Treasury and then sell them to the Fed. And it's simply a shell game for the the Fed is hiding its monetization, but not really. Because I don't think most people realize the Fed has owned a large portion of the federal government's debt forever, ever since they discovered the scissors effect in the late 19-teens and early 1920s. I mean, you go back, uh, you know, what was it, to 2003, 2004, the Fed owned about 10 percent of the U.S. government debt back then. And nobody really talked much about it because it wasn't, didn't seem an issue. So, the Fed, I mean, from the Federal Reserve's perspective, they're not trying to monetize the debt. They're trying to create bank reserves so they can continue this monetary printing fiction. And the only way they can create bank reserves is to buy assets. So they have to buy something, which is the reason why since uh, March 2020, they're buying mortgage bonds. There's no mortgage bond crisis in the, in the U.S. or anywhere around the world, but they have to buy some kind of debt or some kind of asset in order to create bank reserves. So it's not really about monetizing the assets. It's about having these, these, this asset swap take place so that the amount of bank reserves can go up so that people can feel wonderful about the, the fact that Fed's money printer is going burr. Oh, fantastic. I'm Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback, and we will also be replaying this on YouTube. The YouTube should be edited and up uh, sometime in the next week. So go to the financial quarterback, Josh Jelinski, hit the subscribe button, and you'll see that. Next, we're going to go to Bitcoin Tina. Go ahead. I actually, I actually don't have many questions for you right now. Uh, I would just make one quick comment that uh, Bitcoin is a base layer, and there are scaling layers on top of it, uh, which move at very, very high speed virtually instantly. So your, your understanding of Bitcoin needs to be uh, somewhat expanded, Jeff. Um, that's, uh, that's the only comment I have at this point. Thank you, Tina. Next, we're going to go to John. Hey Josh, thanks for uh, 
letting me chime in and organizing this. Uh, Jeff, really appreciate you putting out all the content. You know, as Joe mentioned, been listening to it in these rooms, and um, it's been a, a really enlightening experience. Um, Dr. Lacey Hunt um, has done some work and shown that we're seeing a decreasing or some diminishing returns in, um, by uh, federal stimulus, and I'm talking not by the Fed, but rather by um, um, Congress's deficit spending specifically. And I wonder how much of that concerns you looking into 2022. Um, what thoughts do you have in terms of like how that plays into your thesis? Um, and, and I'd love to kind of know, like, get your thoughts on, on how that form, you know, plays into how you view 2022 playing out. I think that's one of the primary risks about the economic case, not just in the U.S., but globally, is that, look, you know, economists, macroeconomists, especially neo-Keynesian economists, believe that stimulus spending in any form, especially the fiscal side, has a, a positive multiplier, which means the federal government does something. And then it doesn't just, you know, it's not just that activity that creates economic activity. It leads to knock on and follow back and feedback loops, that are positive feedback loops that create more economic activity, that creates more economic activity. So it's basically what John Maynard Keynes called pump priming. Once the Fed or once the federal government does the spending, it's supposed to lead to this virtuous circle of economic activity that we call recovery. When, as you, I think you astutely point out here, that's ne that really had, there's not much evidence for that. In fact, the, the idea that there's a positive multiplier from any fiscal, especially enormous fiscal spending inside of economic environments like that we saw in 2020 and 2021 or in 2008 or 2009 is especially limited and dubious. So I think the major downside risks in the economy are exactly what you said. The federal government in, early, in late 2019 and really early 2021 I'm sorry, late 2020 and early 2021, tremendous amount of fiscal activity, including helicopter payments directly to people, they created enormous frenzy of activity, especially in the goods economy, not the services economy, but in the goods economy, that, that's what really, that's where a, a lot of the consumer price acceleration came from. But if there is no positive or greater than one multiplier from that, then we would expect that the effects of that one-time drop from the helicopter from the federal government to begin to fade. I think we've already seen evidence that that's the case, not just in the US, but around the world where, yeah, there was a tremendous rush of activity, a sugar high in early 2021, but that as most as the year wore on, now we're starting to hear about growth scare and stagflation. And in other places around the world, they're really looking at, at significant downside. And so one of the major risks to 2022 is if the 2021 quote unquote fiscal stimulus didn't actually stimulate much beyond the short run. And I think that history, especially 2009, 2010 with the ARA, our experience there, as well as Japanese experience over the last 30 years, has shown us not to expect lingering or at least longer lasting and durable effects from the, the, from the fiscal side. Can I follow up just really quickly, Josh, if you don't mind? Sure, go um, ahead. Would love to kind of, you know, how, how much in your mind, Jeff, do you think just the amount of debt, um, specifically in, in, in the private markets, like how, how much do you think that that's playing into why we're getting less and less bang for buck, if you will, um, um, for stimulus by the government? Well, I think to me the issue is the monetary system. We have this tremendous monetary drag over the last 14 and a half years that is essentially – it's been, you know, look, we, we, we went to a financialized economy over this monetary evolution I'm talking about going back to the 60s and 70s that depended upon massive amounts of monetary creation and, and, and credit creation that then just went awry. And without continuous, do continuous doses of private credit and money creation, it just doesn't perform in the exact same way as it had beforehand. And so with that lag, it's kind of created this perverse set of incentives, which has created a negative feedback or a positive negative feedback loop, which is essentially where governments are trying to fix an economic problem that's really a monetary problem that they can't fix. And part of that monetary problem gets into things like repo and, and a shortage of collateral, which prioritizes government debt. And because there's a shortage of prioritized government debt, which means the price of that debt goes up and the interest rate on that debt goes down, which has allowed governments to borrow and borrow and borrow. They're essentially riding the coattails of this deflationary collateral shortage, which has allowed them to spend and spend and spend, which doesn't really solve the monetary problem, which is the big problem that we have. And so the debt goes higher and higher and higher with less and less and less economic results from it, not because it's one causing the other, but because both are symptoms of the same thing. And the governments love the fact that 
this collateral shortage has prioritized their debt above all others, which means they can essentially borrow it at close to zero rates. And in many places like Europe or Japan, they're borrowing at negative rates. So we get, we're, we're kind of stuck in this rut or this, this feedback loop where as long as we don't have a, an answer in the collateral system, what do we do? Because that allows governments to continue to make it worse by being more and more inefficient, borrowing and spending in the most inefficient ways. No, thanks. thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Next up, Ryan, go ahead. You're on with Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback, and Jeff Snyder of Alhambra. And, Jeff, uh, what would you like to plug since you're, you're being so generous with your time? I know you do a, uh, an amazing podcast with, what is it, Emil uh, Malinowski? Did I say it right? Emil Kalinowski, yeah. Kalinowski. We have a podcast called Eurodollar University where we explore all of these monetary details, the history, the current events, looking ahead to the future, get into some of the details and deep dives. I also work as, as you said, head of, re head of global research for Alhambra Investments, a registered investment advisor. So if anybody's interested in portfolio management services, they can check me out there. I also do a lot of writing that I post at Alhambra's website. So Eurodollar University, Alhambra, you'll find me somewhere. Thank you. Next up, we're going to go to Ryan. You're on. Ryan, go ahead. Okay. Let's go to Cliff. Let's go, Cliff. Okay, thanks, Josh. Hey, Jeff, thanks so much for doing this. Um, so I, I have really two questions, not necessarily related. You mentioned the Fed is effectuating the buys in the MBS market. Um, they're also talking about pulling back from that. Uh, they're going to taper. Uh, how do you how do you see that effect on cost of capital, thereby asset values for the you know what is ultimately the home the uh, Americans' biggest uh, net worth asset on their net worth statement? What, what do you think? What do you think that does to the home value value? And then the follow up question I'll ask you when you answer this because I think it's related. Well, first of all, the Fed does not set the mortgage rate. Uh, I think that's another misnomer. The, the mortgage rates are essentially the seven year Treasury. The seven to ten-year treasury. Sometimes it's an average, but essentially the bond market sets the mortgage rate. And if the bond market the doesn't believe in the growth and inflation story, then that's that. You know, we're not going to see rising interest rates and in mortgages. Doesn't doesn't their buying help in the supply and demand equation uh, to set the spread above the base rate, whether it's three-year, five-year, seven-year, ten-year treasury? You would think so, but there's really no evidence for it. And it really, it, it makes sense that they wouldn't have that kind of authority or that kind of ability because, again, the bond market is an amalgamation, as Irving Fisher realized more than a century ago, of growth and inflation expectations. And so if the Fed, even though they're buying treasuries or they're buying mortgage bonds, they're actually not buying mortgage bonds. They're actually in the TBA market trying, as well as in the dollar roll market, trying to create more profitable spreads. But if the market doesn't believe it's a more profitable time or uh, to do anything other than the most safest, most liquid mortgage bonds, then it doesn't matter what the Fed's doing, buying or not buying, as we're seeing now. The Fed is supposedly they're actually going to be double tapering and, and supposedly triple rate hikes next year, yet long-term yields, that have, not only have they not budged, they're actually slightly lower, which again reinforces the notion that interest rates, including mortgage rates, are not set by the Fed. They're set by the market, and the market is saying that we don't see any reason why interest rates are going to have to go up, regardless of what Jay Powell thinks. So for the real so estate market, if you're thinking that you know more, uh, higher mortgage rates are going to upset the, or spoil the party, the bond market is not in, is not pricing the scenario where mortgage rates are going to go higher. So my, I guess my related question, I was talking to Peter Bookbar, who's, uh, he's at Blakely, he's an economist, talked to me yesterday about this, and he said, look, the Fed has already said they're, they're signaling they're going to raise multiple times next year. And as you said, it's not about them actually raising. It's about the, the them signaling and what that does to the marketplace. Um, and I said to Peter, I said, Peter, you know, it's like the Mike Tyson line that uh, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. You know, do they have the stomach to keep the raises going in the face of what their what they may ultimately cause, even though we know that uh, their effect may not have a real. It, it's more of an emotional effect than anything else. Yeah, and I think that you know the Fed has shown repeatedly through whatever chairman's whatever Fed chairman's uh, tenure, they don't care. They don't pay attention to these kinds of signals until they're forced to. And a good example of that is when we did this last time, just a couple of years ago. Uh, 
The Federal Reserve was inflation, you know, hawkish, everything in 2018 when the market was sending the same sort of signals, which said there's no reason to believe inflation is going to get out of control. In fact, we're seeing more and more downside to risk emerge. And this was late 2018 when everybody in the media, everybody in the mainstream, all the economists, all the central bankers saying, nope, rates are going to go up, they're going to go up, going up. And the market said, nope, they're not going to go up. And the market was right. In 2019, the Fed actually cut rates because eventually in 2019, the reality became so hard to ignore, the Fed said, yeah, I guess we were wrong. Well, they never said they were wrong, but they, they essentially admitted to it, tacitly admitted to it by cutting rates three times in the late 2019. So I think we're in kind of the same scenario. At least that's what the market is pricing right now when you see the yield curve flattening, the Eurodollar futures curve slightly inverted in one, one, one particular spot along the line, which is the market saying, yeah, Jay Powell, he's going to taper. He might even start raising rates, but at some point he's going to realize his mistake. And his mistake isn't taper or raising rates. That's not really the error. The error is in why he thinks he has to taper and raise rates, which is this inflationary overheated economic scenario when the market is saying there's more downside deflationary risk than there are upside inflationary recovery risk. So, you know, again, it, 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 it gets us into the same type of 2018, 2019 scenario where the Fed, the Fed's just oblivious to reality. All this seems like the market may be, uh, the stock market may be headed for doom next year. What do you think? Well, the st- I mean, who knows? Nobody knows. <laughs> Trying to right. predict what the stock market will do outside of go up at a 45 degree angle is is a very difficult difficult proposition, because the stock market has shown time and time again that it can survive even the biggest uh, hits to the real economy. Because again, as we said before, most people in the financial services industry they tell every hey, Jay Powell's got my back. There's a Fed put. I'm just going to buy regardless of what's going on because. Future earnings are going to be tremendous, even though for the last 10 years or 12 years, whatever it's been since 2009, they haven't been tremendous. In fact, uh, earnings haven't been all that great outside of companies repurchasing their shares. But as far as what what that looks like next next year, it does. It raises the risk of something potentially happening in stocks where stocks are forced to look at the macroeconomic reality in a very different light than the inflation, money printer go brr, the economy's overheated. Once all those things start to fall apart, then, you, okay, maybe there's some risk that, that uh, the people who are, who are comfortable at buying stocks right now and have been throughout this year with everything seemingly going right, will they be as comfortable buying stock next year without those same sort of supports, those so, same sort of psychological supports behind them? I certainly envision, though, if we have a correction next year, the Fed will come out and make some – outlandish announcement like they're buying stocks or proponents of MMT. Yeah. I mean, do, do you ever in your research envision things like that? And, and I mean, it could oh, be disastrous. Josh, it's already happened. Yeah. The Bank of Japan has, buying, has been buying ETFs for years. They have tried to play the role of, hey, we're going we're gonna to manipulate the stock market more directly by buying ETFs. And they did that. And it's you know it's it's all the same kind of psychological shell game. Whereas if you believe that's effective, then you'll act as if it is effective, and that's really what they're trying to do. Uh, there's no real evidence that it has any effect in the real economy because why would there be? Um, can you understand why people believe that they're you know stock market going up? It's supposed to be the, the primary discounting mechanism for economic reality. That's I mean that's what we're taught in in you know in college and economics class. That's the message that gets sent by the financial media over and over again, when you know you look at economic reality, especially since 2008, it does not look anything like the stock market. But you're right, Josh, the Federal Reserve, if the stock market starts to stumble, you've got to be, you better believe they're gonna talk directly to the stock market, as if you could, in, in, in whatever, way they could, whatever way they might think, to try to boost stock prices, because in theory, in their theory, their non-money monetary policy theory, stock prices are central to this signaling mechanism, which is to get everybody to be happy and optimistic. And if share prices are going down, most people, whether they realize what's really going on or not, they get less happy and less optimistic, which is in the uh, in their you know the neo-Keynesian framework. That's a that's a that's a, a negative for um, real economic results. Great. Next up, we're going to go back to Joe, who has another question for Jeff Snyder. Go ahead, Joe. Hi, Jeff. Um, so Dr. Lacey Hunt talks about how 
currently as constituted under the Federal Reserve Act. The Federal Reserve is the lender of last resort, in his words, not the spender of last resort. However, he can foresee a scenario where that may change, where there may be a push in Congress to amend the Federal Reserve Act, to give them the ability, uh, to, as he puts it, to become a ban banana republic bank and become the spender of last resorts. It would effectively make the Fed's liabilities legal tender. I if that came to pass, uh, what effect do you think um, – that would have on, on markets, on the overall monetary system, or would it continue to uh, persist in this sort of, uh, you know, expectations philosophy, uh, excuse me, expectations psychology uh, paradigm? Well, I would disagree with Lacey in, the, in, the, in your first, uh, the first assumption there, which is the Fed is not the lender of last resort. That's what an actual central bank is, and the Fed in this, in this, in this uh, constitution is not a lender of last resort, nor is it really a central bank. And, in, and I think, again, if you got Jay Powell in the room and put a gun to his head, he would tell you, we are not lender of last resort. We thought we were, but then 2008 disabused us of that notion. Essentially, they've tried to become market of last resort, and I think you probably have heard that term thrown around, in the, uh, especially since March of 2020, when Jay Powell has been congratulating himself and patting, him on the, patting himself on the back, not for being a central bank and solving a monetary crisis, but for being a market of last resort by essentially supporting various market prices. So that's, I think, and that's not just a distinction without a difference. That's a functional, it's, it's a functional capacity, and it is, it's, it's, a, it's a really a important signal about what the Fed actually does because it tells us something about what they could do even if they, even if they decide they need to do something different. And the answer, again, is the, the, the trillion-dollar elephant in the room is the banking system. And, a, you know, a lot of scholarship and argument has realized internally as well as externally that, you know, the banking system is the problem. We have this, this, this system, this monetary system that doesn't seem to be working no matter what the Fed does because the Fed is outside of it. So maybe we should try to design various schemes and ways to get around the banking system and go into, and go into the real economy more directly. But that's not, not, that's not anything new either. The Japanese have tried this several times, including in the late 1990s, and it still it doesn't end up in, the, in, in, in an inflationary recovery or anything like that because – Essentially, what we're talking about with the banking system being in a broken situation is that the intermediation function of the entire financial system, the entire monetary system, has broken down. And central banks, not to get too far into this, but central banks are ill-suited. In fact, they're the last thing we want we're trying to perform any kind of intermediation function, which is essentially credit allocation in the real economy, even though that's the direction that a lot of central banks are starting to creep. You hear them talking about ESG and climate change and getting involved in those kinds of things. That's essentially intermediation and credit allocation, which you know is not going to be a, a, an improvement even over a broken banking system because anytime you introduce top-down central planning and politics into that sort of vital economic function, it doesn't really end well. So, yeah, I mean, the Fed has already started to creep in that direction, but I don't think it essentially leads to, again, this money printer, runaway inflation type scenario. I think it leads more toward the Japanese scenario, which is the more the government does, the less successful, less success they will have. Yeah, I definitely see the Japanese scenario. Do you have any other follow-ups, Joe? No, I think that was great. I appreciate it. Well, the only thing I'll add is that if anybody has a question here, I don't know how much time we have. We're probably running short, but uh, raise your hand while we have uh, a Jeff here. Yeah, if you have a question, raise your hand, and Joe will uh, put you in the queue. So you, you were hesitant to give any stock market predictions or anything, but what do you see, you know, what's the, what's your economic outlook for 2022? Yeah, the more macroeconomic outlook, I think, you know, judging by the way the curves have behaved over the last nine months since March, uh, really February 24th, is that, you know, there's, there's more downside risk and deflationary potential than most people appreciate. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to go into recession next year. It's going to be something terrible and awful, but it does. It tends to say, you know, suggest and indicate balance of probabilities are tilted toward the downside. And how that, how the stock market reacts to something like that, you know, that's that's it's, it's almost impossible to predict because the stock market most times has been is bulletproof and impenetrable to any sort of, of macro reality whatsoever. But it could lead to some kind of risk. But I think. You know, downside downside case is building as as 2021 draws to a close, and 2022 uh, as begins under clouds of suspicion that start with 
baiting U.S. government stimulus. It starts with enormous questions in China. What are the Chinese actually doing? It's not a robust situation in China either. And then you look at uh, uh, elsewhere around the world, like Europe and emerging markets, in which you realize that, you know, the rebound out from 2020 into 2021 may not have been as good as everybody thought it was. It's certainly the picture that was presented by, you know, the frenzy in the U.S. goods economy and the CPI rates that, that it that generated makes it seem like everything is doing, uh, the whole global economy is doing really well, when in truth it may not be doing well at all. And now we have all of these, uh, all of that momentum exhausted, and there's really a downside case in 2022. Don't really know what it looks like just yet. It's just that 2022 begins very differently than 2021 did. What asset classes do you like at Alhambra? We like every asset class. <laughs> it really depends on the, the, the uh, individual client's risk tolerance and what they're looking to do. And it may be that, you know, looking at this downside case, you start thinking more about preservation of capital than making money. But it may be, look, hey, look, we're going to look at, if, even if the downside case and the deflationary case does emerge, maybe look at some ways that we can make money from the opportunity that presents. So, you know, if you're really convinced that there's a downside there, you can go long duration or something like that, which is a, it's a very risky trade. But if you, if you really believe in the downside case, that's someplace where you can actually make money. You can buy all sorts of, you know, deflationary hedges and things like that. It really depends on what you're seeking to do next year and what, how you respond and how you're comfortable with, the potential for, you know, 2022 uh, coming out as something very different than 2021. Fantastic. Sounds like the compliance people got to you. <laughs> no. um, next up. We're you know how this up. works. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> next up, we have Luke. Go ahead. You're on with Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. And folks, if you miss any of this episode, you can go to YouTube, hit the subscribe button, search for me, Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. It'll be up later this week, also on iHeartRadio. Uh, I, I don't know if it hits Saturday or Sunday. Uh, so thank you for joining us. If you have a question, be sure to raise your hand, and we'll get to you in the queue as soon as we can. Next up, uh, we have Luke. Go ahead. Yeah, hey, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'll probably preface my question with saying I'm probably one of those hyperinflationary fanboys who thinks we are going to get inflation. Um, I, the question I've got for Jeff is – you look at the 51 out of 52 nations that have accumulated debt to GDP ratios of 130% or higher since 1800. And generally, you know, 51 of the 52 have defaulted on that debt. And generally, they do it through high inflation and currency devaluation. Are, are you expecting every nation around the world to be the, be the one in that example and do the Japanese? Do you think it's possible that uh, every single nation just does that? And then kind of the second part of that question is... If we all head down the Japan route where we have 200, 300, 400% debt to GDP ratios, what's the end game with that? How long do you think that kind of economy or new financial experiment kind of goes on for? Well, I think that there's actually two questions there. And the first part of that is you're right. I think there are certain economies around the world that have been piling up debt to try to do something about this globalization rut, deglobalization actually. Um, they're, they're going to go boom, one by one. Some of these economies around the world are going to implode. And I think we're already seeing one in Turkey where we're seeing all the, the classic examples of where this leads to in some of those more, more uh, uh, susceptible economies to this type of, type of deflationary global system. And so, yeah, it, it can be the case where we have the Japanese sort of trend in the United States, Japan, Europe, and around the developed world where we don't have the potential for debt that, that's just being uh, completely written off, where some of the emerging markets or some of the smaller economies that are, that are plugged into and dependent upon the former globalization trend, they're not going to be able to cope, and they're going to have to do what countries all around the world have done throughout history, as you just pointed out. They're going to have to find some way, either a debt jubilee, which is difficult to pull off, Currency devaluation, which is also difficult to pull off, but maybe that's what they're going to end up doing. But, the, but the, my point is that there's, there's no one, one pathway forward here, and that I think you will see economies around the world, smaller national economies, especially in emerging markets, that have built up a tremendous amount of debt over the last several years, anticipating a developed world economic recovery that's just never going to come. They're going to have to – eventually, they're going to have to pay the piper one way or the other. 
Now, I think where you get the Japanese case is in the U.S. Obviously, Japan, nothing's going to change there. Europe and around the developed world. And I think we're going to add China into that as well. So most of the major big economies, I don't think they go, they, they go into the hyperinflationary devaluation or anything like that. And I don't think you see any debt jubilees because one reason why is, again, because of the, the mode of, of, of deflation that we've seen, especially in collateralized money markets like repo and derivatives, has prioritized their, their government bonds. So these, the, the, even though the U.S. government, for example, has run up in a massive amount of, of fiscal debt, it's still selling at enormously high prices because the market values the collateral and the use of collateral more than it is afraid of the you know, credit risks involved with having borrowed way too much money. So essentially, you do have the, the pathway for the Japanese case in the United States, in Europe, and around some places the rest of the world that may not apply to other places like you know emerging markets, like Turkey and some others. Thanks for that. That was a brilliant answer. Um, and I, I love your work on the euro dollar, so keep on doing that. I'm only halfway through your series of videos with Robert Breedlove, and they're great. So uh, thanks for your work on the euro dollar system. No one seems to talk about it. Thank you for listening. Next up, uh, we're going to go to – who do we have next? Ben, go ahead. Hey, thanks. Um, Jeff, I have another question. So one of the parts of your thesis that I, I kind of – I'm struggling to understand is is about the interest rates. We are at almost historic all time low interest rates. We've seen them go negative in Europe, um, and and on the other hand, we have your thesis, which is kind of antithetical to con like conventional wisdom, quote unquote. So, what would you say, either you know mechanically, directionally, psychologically? What is pegging interest rates at near zero and negative? What is causing that to happen? Because it seems antithetical to your your argument. No, it's not at all. In fact, it's, it's, it's the evidence that my argument is correct. Once you realize that the, the interest rate fallacy, as Milton Friedman called it in the 1960s, the mainstream has interest rates all wrong. And when I say interest rates, we're talking mostly about uh, bond yields and things like that. Um, Low interest rates are a sign of tight money, historically speaking, and not just in the U.S., but all around the world. Think about the 1930s in the U.S., the Great Depression. Nobody would consider that an inflationary period. It was a deflationary period. Interest rates went low and lower throughout the 1930s, not higher. Uh, in the 1970s, the Great Inflation, what did interest rates do in the 1970s? They went up and up and up. And how you make sense of that is what are government bond yields specifically? Not only are they growth and inflation expectations, they are the safest, most liquid instrument. And so if the safest, most liquid instruments are in high demand, especially high demand from the monetary infrastructure itself, what does that tell you about the perceptions of safety and liquidity? If you only want to own safe and liquid, which drives the prices of those safe and liquid instruments up, meaning their interest rates down, it says that, the, that they're more worried about safety and liquidity than anything else. So low interest rates on government bond yields are absolutely consistent with the idea of monetary tightness, especially since 2008. So what we're really saying is that low interest rates are telling you the Fed is – it's all a lie. It's all a fairy tale. The quantitative easing isn't money printing. The fact that interest rates have gone only lower and lower tells you that the problem is not only – it hasn't been solved – it seems to be getting incrementally worse every time we go through these dollar shortage spasms. So it's actually consistent with everything. Oh, fantastic. Next up, John had another question for you. Go ahead, John. Yeah, so John, I joined a little late, so it's good that Jeff hit on this. Um, I think, you know, I apologize, but I do think one of the things that we struggle to communicate in this room, and we've had a bunch of debates, um, is just about how federal um, – about how bank reserves can't be used to create credit, um, and I think we're seeing – and I'd love to kind of get Jeff's take on this in general, but would love for you to explain that. And then two, kind of perhaps discuss why um, commercial banks perhaps don't have the, the incentive really to be lending to create credit and create actual dollars in the real economy, and I'd love to kind of get your take on how that's developed over the last you know, 12, 18 months or so. Yeah, that's a complicated subject, but it really gets down to balance sheet capacity, which is sort of a ubiquitous but ambiguous term about how banks actually fit assets and liabilities on their balance sheet. And essentially what it comes down to is they don't need bank reserves. 
If banks were willing to extend credit, they would just create the liability to offset it, right? You know, everybody knows about fractional reserve lending and deposit multipliers and things like that. It's basically the same thing, but the, the numbers are different in the, in the, the uh, scheme for governing, especially the asset side of a balance sheet, is not the same as a depository fractional reserve lending, but it's the same kind of idea. So if banks were, uh, let, they were not risk averse, if they were willing to take on risk as they had been up until the 2008 crisis, then they don't need bank reserves. In fact, that's why there were no bank reserves in the, in the system up until 2008, because banks would simply say, I wanna add risky assets, I wanna add a ton of risky assets, and I'll figure out the liability side as I go. So private money creation was the answer to the liability when there's asset side balance sheet room. So bank reserves don't really matter here. So the issue is, it does, if, the bank, if the level of bank reserves are low, but banks don't wanna add to their balance sheet, then there won't be any credit creation. If bank reserves are low, but balance sheet creation is pliable and flexible and banks are willing to take on risk, then again, it doesn't matter the, the level of bank reserves, banks will find the monetary resources, the liability side to match the assets. So the level of bank reserves is immaterial to what the banking system does. What the banking system does. The banking system itself governs that behavior based on these balance sheet considerations and metrics. Okay, any other questions? I don't see any more in the queue, Josh. No one else is I raising have, their hand. I, I have one more question. question. Um, where would you say, Jeff, where would you say the banking system is relative to where it was coming into 2007 and 8? Where, where is it today relative to that? Its safety, its, uh, you know, its position in the marketplace. Is it as strong? Is it worse? Is it kind of, what do you think? It's sort of a contradiction, right? Because in one sense, the banking system is a hell of a lot stronger, a hell of a lot more uh, put together and safe than it was entering 2007 when balance sheets were just all over the place and leveraged to, leveraged to the hilt. Um, so in one sense, banks are safe, which is why you probably won't see another Lehman Brothers or rash of failures at any time in the near future, or even the, the longer term future. But it's, in the same sense, you know, we depended upon banks being stupid to create money and to create credit that allowed the global economy to go. So now that they're safe and, you know, as JP Morgan calls it, they have, they've created this fortress balance sheet that's the stock full of liquid assets and safe assets. You know, ironically, the safer banks are, the worse off it is for the system because the system absolutely required this balance sheet flexibility and pliability, this, this willingness by, of banks to, to add to their balance sheets, to create money, to create credit that they're not willing to do. So paradoxically, the safer they are, the worse off it is for the, for the global economic system, even though, you know, we won't see any more Lehman Brothers. Thanks. Great answer. I've got another question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, I've got another question as well for Jeff. Um, with the Treasury market breaking in the March 2020 uh, equity market sell-off, um, firstly, probably another two-part question. Sorry, Jeff. Um, how how did you see that whole event unfolding? And, and probably the second part of the question is: in the next equity market sell-off, if it is as big and as rapid as the one in 2020 was, if the treasury market breaks again, what do you think of that entire kind of scenario? Well, first of all, this treasury market breaking is a fiction created by the market of last resort, which is what the Federal Reserve actually did. And that's what Jay Powell's been patting himself on the back for. He's saying that, no, we're not a lender of last resort, we're a market of last resort, we saved the treasury market, when that wasn't true. What actually happened in March 2020 was a dollar shortage that, that basically offloaded all of this dollar funding capacity on a repo market that just couldn't handle that kind of capacity because the repo market was experiencing a funding crisis too. To, to, I'm going to, to oversimplify and skip a bunch of steps here, essentially dollar shortage outside the United States, reserve managers around the world faced with the shortage began to sell their off the run treasuries to dealers, not just inside the United States, but all over the world. And the dealers were kind of obligated to take those off the hands of reserve managers because reserve managers are some of their biggest customers. And so reserve managers faced with a dollar short, and by the way, the dollar short is what the lender of last resort central bank is supposed to deal with, the trouble at the front, not the trouble at the back. That's what the Fed should have been focused on, but the Fed isn't actually a central bank. So as this dollar short is created selling, especially in off the run treasuries, that burden dealers who usually when they buy off the run treasuries from reserve managers, repo those because they don't want to stick them on their balance sheet. They're illiquid, they're illiquid as they are. 
So we had this flood of illiquid off the run treasuries hit the repo market that was itself experiencing a funding spasm. And so what happened is the treasury market didn't necessarily break. It broke down and bifurcated. And it did, this, it did so in the same way it had in, in uh, uh, October, November of 2008, which was that on the run treasuries, the best of the best of the best co uh, co collateral, they were still negotiable and prices were still fine there. And if you had that collateral available, you could still access the repo and derivatives market. It was really the off the run stuff that was predicated by this global dollar shortage and reserve managers trading or reserve managers pawning them off on dealers who then couldn't repo them. They created this breakdown in the treasury market that required Jay Powell to come in and save everyone. When in fact, if Jay Powell had actually been at the head of a central bank, he would have circumvented the whole process by being lender of last resort and dealt with the dollar shortage before it became a treasury market problem. So March 2020 is a perfect example of what I'm talking about here when they say the Federal Reserve isn't actually a, a central bank. So that part of it is another misnomer that's, that's sort of been mythologized as the Fed has done a good job, when it's really an example of the, how the Fed isn't what everybody thinks it is. And really, if we, the, the whole issue there is we had a global dollar shortage that caused the predicate, the predicate processes that led to this treasury market breakdown. So if there wasn't a dollar shortage, we don't have a problem in any of these markets. Do you see a dollar shortage on the horizon? Well, that's, I mean, that's one of the primary risks that, is, that gets embedded in these flattening and low uh, curves, not just in the U.S. charges, but global bonds around the world, which is saying, look, there's deflationary potential in the monetary system. And, you know, going back to 2008, as well as March 2020, one of the primary modes of failure in the monetary system, the deflationary failure, is this collateral problem, the collateral shortage where everybody's squeezed into the to the best of the best of the best collateral because the system, the dollar shortage causes all sorts of systemic feedback effects, as we saw in March 2020, similar to, uh, to October 2008. So the market is saying, you know, here we are in 2021, and we still have a collateral shortage issue that can become a collateral scarcity problem that breaks down global liquidity in all these same, these same various ways. So that is one of the things that I believe that the market is looking at and saying, one of the reasons why we're not very optimistic about next year is that the collateral scarcity is still a big issue. And if deal dealers, again, become risk averse because of any number of reasons that we already talked about, then the, the collateral scarcity or the collateral, short, or collateral scarcity becomes an outright collateral shortage, which is an enormous problem. What is an indicator to look at collateral scarcity? You can't just like put, put it out on your iPhone, can you? I wish you could. I wish there was a number. I wish there was a signal, a data series, right? Really, there's a couple of different ways to do it. One is to look at the T-bill market, uh, especially the front of the T-bill, the four-week, eight-week, sometimes the three months. What they tell you is the price, the, the, the uh, relative price and the relative demand for the best of the best collateral, because the front-end T-bills are the best quality collateral there is, especially relative to something like the reverse repo rate. So we've seen all throughout this year where T-bill rates are less than the reverse repo rate, which is a almost pure signal of collateral scarcity. That's one way you can do it. You look at the marketplace and say the demand for T-bills is so, so high that market participants are willing to take on these instruments, which would yield less than they could get at something like the reverse repo window. So there's an indication right there that tells you, hey, there's collateral scarcity. And by the way, right now, Today in the treasury bill market, that's what we see, bill rates, bill yields that are less than the reverse repo, which says a high degree of demand for reasons that have nothing to do with investment characteristics. Do you see, do, do you find the uh, yield curve inversion as a, um, as a sign that's uh, a strong indicator or not really? Do you put much stock in that? I look at the yield curve at all times, not just inversion. I think that's the mistake a lot of people make is to think, oh, you only pay attention to the yield curve when it inverts. No, you should always pay attention to the yield curve in all sorts of environments because it tells you any number of, of, of good things, a lot of, a lot of good information that's useful. And what we're seeing over the last, as I said before, nine months is that the yield curve has flattened and flattened dramatically. Now, it's not inverted, but it has flattened, which is the market suggesting that downside risk deflationary potential is rising what we should see if the market believes that these cpis were legitimate inflation or caused by money printing then the, the the yield curve not just in the u.s but around the world the yield curves would steepen which means that the the long-term rates would rise much faster than we'd see at the short end and we're not seeing that we're seeing the exact opposite where short end rates are kind of rising 
to get used to or to get in position for the Fed's hawkish regime, while long-term rates have been sideways to lower, and so the yield curve is dramatically flattened. So even though the yield curve has not inverted, you should pay attention to that flattening because this dynamic change in shape is a very, very negative signal. Even if it's not, hey, there's a recession coming or whatever, it tells you something important about the, the inflationary or the monetary environment in general. Hey, Jeff, did, given the fact that you've outlined uh, some reasons to be concerned potentially about growth in the real economy moving into next year and the quote-unquote inflation due to supply shocks is a drag on the economy and it's hurting millions of Americans in the form of increased prices, why do you think the Fed wants to set expectations that a tightening is the right move here? I mean, clearly, you think they're just completely wrong and they're misinterpreting these supply shocks as uh, something that's a monetary phenomenon? That's, and that's again, it, when you when you realize what the Fed actually is and what it does, what they're doing makes sense. Now it's wrong, but it makes sense. What they're doing is they look at inflation not through the monetary lens because they can't. As we said before, they're not a, they're not a central bank and they don't do the money. I mean, this should be a really simple thing, right? Inflation is money, so the Fed should be able. I mean, the Fed more than anybody else should be able to look at the monetary system and say, "Yep, there's too much money." But that's not what the Fed does. They have no idea if there's too much money or not. And so, what do you do about inflation? And the way the Fed works is, again, expectation, and they actually call it inflation expectation. And so the reason the Fed is tapering and, and, and becoming more hawkish is that they're concerned through their theory and their worldview that people are getting normalized to high rates of CPI, uh, CPI inflation, which isn't really inflation, but they're worried that, people, that, that people's inflation expectations are getting out of control, and that's where inflation comes from. So for even for the Fed and their inflation theory, it's not about money. It's about expectations. And so their concern is that people are becoming normalized to high rates of consumer price advances, and then that will feed into expectations for more and more and more, and therefore they need to stop that before it gets out of control. So regardless of what we're seeing in downside risks, regardless of what we're seeing in the actual monetary system, the Federal Reserve is worried about inflation expectations when there's really no evidence that inflation expectations have anything to do with inflation whatsoever. But in the Federal Reserve's econometric neo-Keynesian framework, this makes perfect sense because the more CPI rates go up and stay high, the more they think they have to worry about people becoming normalized to it. And so they're trying to break that by becoming hawkish and saying, oh, we're going to stop the inflation cycle because we're going to hike rates and taper QE. In a lot of ways, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Ooh, go ahead, Jason. Why don't you go ahead? I've, I've asked a bunch of questions. Yeah, no worries. Say, Jeff, this is Jason Williams. Uh, uh, so a lot of us Bitcoiners uh, defend the the kind of argument around power utilization and mining that, you know, Bitcoin's caused a bit of a renaissance around solar, wind, hydro, geothermal and biomass and all types of different renewable uh, energy production resources. I just finished reading again Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One. He's very contrarian on renewables. I just want your position is on it. Do you think that they're they're investable? Is there money to be made here? Do you believe in them, or is this just a money suck? You're talking about renewable energy as a pure renewable energy, uh, you know, regardless of any other implication. That, that's right. Yeah, I think, you know, you have to be concerned about renewable energy as a standalone product because it depends so much upon subsidies and mass market adoption, which seems to be very slow in, in, in becoming anything other than, you know, another way to, to, for rent seekers to ex extract um, you know, concessions or even, even meant, uh, monetary resources from the government. And it's, I think in a lot of ways it goes along with the central bank's mission creeps into that type of area where – we're, we're allocating resources not based on efficiency, but based on more political implications and things like that. So I, you know, for me, renewable energies, while you know it's a very good idea, they're not being they're not being driven by market forces so much as top down approach. Uh, top down approach. Hey Josh, you mind if I follow up on the? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, placebo effect question that Joe had asked, and, and, and Jeff, just to kind of go back to the question before Jason, just like. One, and maybe really quickly, do you think that's why um, 30 days after announcing the taper, they announced, or uh, Powell announced the acceleration of the taper? Does that fall in line with kind of the, the answer you gave to Joe's um, question uh, before Jason's? 
Oh, absolutely. There's there's this idea, again, that we need to head off expectations before it becomes too far. And the way that the Fed does that is not by, you know, you would think that taper, if, if, if this was really money printing, the Fed would just say, how much liquidity in the economy do we actually need? And have we met that goal? And so the taper should be about money, but it's not. It's about expectation. And what sure. they're doing is creating a series of events that shock the public, or at least, you know, attend to shock the public's consciousness, right? Because that's how it, how they believe it works. And so you taper, and that's supposed to be a hawkish shock. And then maybe that didn't work. So now you got to double taper, and then you got to go into rate hikes. It's all about creating events that create that uh, creating events that can be then used as these signals into the real economy or into real markets as the Fed as the Fed wants it to be. They want them to be signals, not actually monetary questions. And so yeah, double taper was hey, we need to have another event so that we can get the public's attention and, let, and get them to believe that we're doing something about sure. inflation before it becomes embedded in expectation. Maybe maybe one other kind of quick follow-up on that, like so, or maybe separately, but I, I think you, you mentioned mission creep um, of the Fed, and uh, if you listen to Powell's comments, um, he often uses the term maximal employment, really doesn't cite how they measure it or how it weighs into their <laughs> into they have no idea. Their, uh, <laughs> yeah. But but you know, Dr. Hunt's talked about this in terms of when the Fed had you know when the Fed took on um, sort of some mission creep, as you say, um, of focusing on employment. Um, and I wonder like what your take is on how that maybe has impacted um, the monetary system, the Fed in the whole, and and maybe what that's led to, and how perhaps that may be part of how we got to where we are today. That was part of the monetary breakdown coming out of the 60s and 70s. If you don't know money, you can't know inflation. And so what the Fed had to come up with was various different ways to match and monitor their expectations policy with real economic outcomes, right? In a real money-based central banking system, you just you print enough money, you print enough liquidity. If you go too far, you get inflation, you cut back on the money supply, the inflation normalizes. That's how it's supposed to work. But if you don't do anything in money, how do you know if any of this expectations fairy tale is actually having the effect? And one of the ways that they tried to circumvent this monetary issue, monetary blind spot, was through using all of these various economic aggregates. So they look at something like this, not just the CPI rate, but the unemployment rate. And so they put inflation into the context of the Phillips curve, which means that at some point you would think that in the, the unemployment rate falls far enough that leads to an inflationary trade-off where companies have to you know, uh, outbid each other for workers, and so wage prices go or wage rates go up, which means companies are paying more for for uh, labor, which then leads into consumer prices and, and so on. So again, without the monetary capacity, they've been stuck trying to use all of these bypasses and workarounds to try to monitor their own success. And having thought that the unemployment rate was a good sort of barometer for how things are going, that sort of was disabused a couple years ago, and especially in 2018 and 2019. When the unemployment rate fell to 50-year lows, yet we didn't see the spike in inflation that they would otherwise have. In fact, that's what they were expecting, especially in 2019, which caused them to say and to rethink that maybe we don't know what maximum employment actually is. Maybe the unemployment rate is, is actually faulty and that the participation problem is really a, a, a product of macroeconomic factors and not strictly you know, breakdowns in some of the labor market trends. So the Fed is looking at the unemployment rate in a very different light than it did a few years ago, but it still has to depend upon the unemployment rate because it really doesn't have any other way to monitor and measure whether or not it's having success. So if the unemployment rate continues to fall, while they don't rely on it as much as, as they did a couple of years ago, it's still one of the primary signals on their quote-unquote inflation dashboard. Hey, on that note, Jeff, do you follow uh, websites like Shadow Stats or the Chapel Inflation Index? Because they kind of show unemployment not 5 or 6% like the Fed says it is, but it's much more like 20 to 25%. Yeah, you do. You have to take account of the, uh, the participation problem because it goes along with basically everything else you see in the bond market or even just economic data, general economic data because – you know, GDP in the United States, Europe, and across the rest of the world fell off trend in 2008. And that's one of the reasons why we have a participation problem, because the economy has never recovered from the Great Recession because it wasn't really a recession. It was a monetary breakdown. And so, you know, you do have to pay attention to the fact that the unemployment rate is fake. It's faulty. 
Donald Trump was right about that in 2016. There is millions upon millions of Americans that have been left out of the labor force because the economy has never recovered. Now, economists have tried to come up with any number of explanations to explain that away. They try to blame it on American workers. They're too lazy. They're drug addicted. They won't go back to school. All sorts of nonsense when the problem is actually that the real economy has never recovered. And so you know, workers aren't joining the labor force because there's no reason for them to join a labor force. There's no jobs available for them. And that's why the unemployment rate didn't lead to inflation in 2018, because the unemployment rate was not an accurate measure of the actual economic situation. Now, whether or not, I mean, the shadow stats, I don't use any of the shadow stats, but I do believe, you know, I do look at the labor force participation rate, which is way, way below where it was in 2008, let alone, you know, 1999, which tells you something is wrong in the labor market, which, by the way, is consistent, as John Maynard Keynes had pointed out in the 1920s, is perfectly consistent with, with, consist with continuous deflationary money. Deflation always impacts the labor market first and foremost. Since we talked about shadow stats, where do you go for research? Like, what are the three things you look at every day? I look at the market. I look at actual primary data sources. So if we're talking about, you know, uh, what is the labor market doing, I'm going to use the BLS's, uh, uh, BLS website and the BLS data. They're going to tell you what, what they believe is going on in the real economy. Uh, market prices, you look at the yield curve. What's the shape of the yield curve doing today? What are the T-bill rates doing? Look at euro dollar futures, interest rate swap prices, primary source material. That's what you need to use. Fantastic. So uh, we are rounding out this amazing interview. want to thank you, Jeff Snyder of Alhambra Investments. Folks, make sure you uh, subscribe to his podcast. It's, what is it, Eurodollar Futures? Eurodollar Euro Futures. University. Euro Dollar University. University with Emil Kalinowski. So that's, uh, we, we want to thank yeah, you for joining you us, Jeff. About, oh, go ahead, guys. About 500, I was going to say, you have about... 500 weekly subscribers in this room. You've uh, you pretty much uh, play your uh, your podcasts um, almost weekly um, um, in this room and, and have discussions about them. So um, certainly appreciate all the content. Appreciate you taking some time. Sure, it's probably dinner time for you, but really enlightening as always. So really appreciate you taking the time. It's my pleasure. You know, I I love the fact that you that anybody's actually interested because I know this can be dense, it can be boring, it can be complicated and. In some ways, that's interesting and exciting to a certain set of people. So I'm, I'm actually happy that, that anybody pays attention to it at all. Well, you, because you I think that the more people, people talk about right? it, the better off we're all yeah. going to be. Because we need to stop think, stop, you know, listening to, hey, the Fed is the central bank. that the, They're all powerful. And, you know, QE is money printing. Once we get past that stuff, then we'll start solving some of these problems. Well, thank you so that's much great. for joining us. And, folks, if you missed any part of the interview – it will be available on YouTube later this week. Just go to Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. Also, we'll be on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and podcasts. Just subscribe to my podcast, The Financial Quarterback, and we'll be replaying this on New York's 710-WORAM. I want to thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Jeff Snyder, Alhambra Investments. I hope to have you on again in the future. Thanks for having me, Josh. My pleasure. Had a great time. Thanks. So, Clubhouse, I guess you can continue to use this room and have a good time in the uh, Bitcoin Club. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Josh, that was Thanks, fantastic. Josh. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, Thank you, for participating. Josh. Thank you, Josh. That was great.